Uh, day four, video three, the, the spiritual practice. So our spiritual practice for today, which is derived from uh, Sir John Templeton's book, uh, I, I phrase it this way, seeing differently. Um, we often, we may tend to think of spiritual practice in a somewhat stereotypical matter as just involving sitting quietly somewhere and watching our breath or meditating or perhaps in, in, uh, praying. Uh, and by prayer, in this case, I would mean what is thought of in, in the Catholic tradition and the, in the Christian monastic traditions as contemplative prayer, which is a very, very, very quiet, serene practice of sitting quietly with, uh, by oneself and going deep, deep within. But spiritual practices, as I mentioned early on, there's also a reflective a kind of spiritual practice that makes use actively of our, of our minds, of our intellects. It's not just a matter of quieting our minds, but it's also a matter of using our minds to refine our, our intellect in such a way that it becomes a tool whereby we can probe our conditioning and subtly undercut it, where we can uh, cut through confused, unclear, and unhelpful ways of thinking so that we can clear the ground to think in more constructive and helpful ways. This is a basic, basic, basic practice. Some may not even think of it as spiritual, may think of it as just some sort of ethical training. But any acquaintance with the spiritual traditions of the world's religion shows that they're they are all grounded upon ethical purification, ethical cleansing, and uh, uh, to overcome the harmful ways of thinking that give rise to unbeneficial ways of acting and treating others and treating our world. And so a reflective uh, capacity, an insight capacity, is, is essential to the spiritual life. Um, and so a seeing differently, then, is an insight practice as opposed to a concentration practice. It's a way of using the stilled and refined mind to cut through um, the, the layers of unspiritual conditioning that often cloud our everyday consciousness. So um, one way uh, to, th to think about how we might see differently a very helpful example is given by Sir John when he talks about painting a picture. And this is an illustration that I've often used as well when trying to convey this idea. Suppose you say to someone, paint a cat. Paint a, or create a picture of a cat. Well, you can only imagine how different the responses to that might be. Create an image or a picture of a cat. Some people might go and paint what they think very literally is a cat, but then think about how, Mat how Matisse might have painted that cat, or Monet, or Van Gogh, or your, your, yourself when you're in a painting mood, or perhaps you don't paint, perhaps you take out a camera, or perhaps you create a poem. And in any case, even, uh, even if you were to take a photograph of a cat, there are so many kinds of cats and so many ways of taking a photograph of a cat, so many ways of lighting the scene. So we begin to get the idea here that uh, what we think we see isn't, is not, what we think we see is only one aspect, one facet of the infinite uh, detail that's available and even the most every day a kind of scene. If I look at this wall over here, I see a couple of patches of color. You can't see it. And yet, if we, take, if we were to go down in levels of description, down towards the subatomic level, there's an infinite, num infinite amount of activity going on there. So what we think we see is only a very limited uh, patch or portion of what is actually there. Uh, as uh, Sir John uh, expresses it, a dozen people could carefully study a lovely panoramic view and then draw or paint a picture of it. The results may reveal a dozen pictures with strikingly different details. Each person is observing the scene that appears before him or her with eyes that have the same basic structure, but each expresses it differently. That's the basic idea. 
that I also tried to express in the image of, of taking an image of a, creating an image of a cat. So how would we practice? Well, this is not a practice that you have to sit somewhere quietly to do. You can, we can do this in the middle of our uh, often demanding and strenuous lives. For instance, take, take the, think of a recent disagreement that you may have had with a loved one or with a friend or with a colleague uh, in which you felt that you are absolutely right and the other person felt as if they were absolutely right. Stalemate, deadlock, yes, perhaps this is an experience that you've had at some point, maybe recently. Um, now, the way of seeing differently here is to try to see that this is, may seem like an everyday and even trite kind of suggestion, but these suggestions often are very simple but often overlooked. So imagine, try now to see that whole scenario from what you imagine to be the other person's perspective. Now add a third element. Try to imagine that someone that this whole interaction was 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 recorded, and today, of course, with our cam with cameras everywhere, with smartphones, uh, who knows? It probably was recorded. And imagine a third person, completely unknown to the both of you, watching that video. What might their perspective be? Certainly, they would probably see something that neither of you saw. Would they judge someone to be right and someone to be wrong? Would they find that both of you were somewhat right and somewhat wrong? How about introducing a fourth perspective, a fifth perspective, an eighth, a tenth, a twelfth perspective? Until infinity. And so it's actually the, what this does then is it introduces the notion of perspectives into our thinking. And this can help undermine any uh, sense that um, a, a, a sometimes a self-righteous sense that what I think is the truth. You know, sometimes this gives rise to very stubborn kinds of thinking in people. It, this, this is my truth. This is the way I see it. I will not be moved. And there's virtue in that to a point, because if we will not be moved, but it is actually the case that it's not a helpful or maybe even wrong way of viewing things, then it would be better for us if we would allow ourselves to be moved. And that's, you know, honesty, spiritual honesty is so essential to the spiritual life. And spiritual honesty means allowing the, the reality to emerge in our consciousness that I might not always be right or that we might not always be right. That's what leads to spiritual pride. And spiritual pride may sound like a, a minor failing, but spiritual pride is responsible for a lot of religious strife. And so it's actually a very basic ascetical or cleansing practice for spiritual people to practice seeing differently, to try to see from a broader perspective, to put our own views, our own wants, which are often shaded or, or uh, 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 colored by our, our, our own ego and impulses, to try to put that a little bit on the shelf and to see life from a broader perspective. This is, um, this is I, as I said before, is an insight practice. It's, it's not a sit down and meditate practice. I can use this in any circumstance that I find myself in. Um, if I were to systematically do this, you might think that would get exhausting, and it could. But, you know, part of the spiritual life is carefulness, and Sir John would have agreed with this. The Zoroastrian tradition anciently taught um, a kind of moral realism that influenced Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and probably influenced Buddhism as well. A moral realism that says that our choices, our decisions, our thoughts count. And in every moment, our thoughts and our decisions are being corrupted or refined by how we respond to the different situations that, that, that we confront. So every moment presents us with an opportunity to engage in this clarifying practice of asking myself if I'm actually seeing clearly here. We should, we, if we can learn how to see differently, we will often find that um, the realization is that, no, I could actually do better here. Uh, I could actually be more compassionate. I could be more caring. I can be less selfish. I can be less uh, impulsive, less quick to respond.
In our time and place, this kind of simple moral teaching, one might even say moralism, is essential because so many of the traditional forms of self-regulation that were there as part of institutions that have vanished are gone. And it's really up to us now to take this, this ethical discipline, this ascetical practice into our own hands so that we can use it to improve our quality of life and the quality of life of everyone around us.